Good morning. I, I am the newest commissioner, um, but I was appointed in, in 2013. And when Governor Meade talked to me about the position and told me it was a six-year term, that just seemed like a really long time. Uh, but I'm halfway through my term already, so it's gone very quickly. Um, I'm enjoying it immensely, and I'm really pleased to be here today to tell you about my amazing experience in going to China last summer. Before I start, um, how many people in the room have been to China? Oh, wow. Okay, so I'm speaking to a, a, a well-versed crowd. Uh, I really am going to focus the first part of my presentation on our actual trip, the cities that we visited, uh, some of the conversations that we had, and then the second half of my presentation, I want to talk about some comparisons between our countries, um, especially on some of the greenhouse gas emissions that Jason alluded to and some other issues. Our trip was sponsored by the Department of Energy um, and some China entities. I think many of you have met David Moeller um, from DOE. He was the head of the delegation for DOE. Uh, there were probably six people from DOE and then five commissioners that, that uh, went on the trip. Many of you know about the Office of Clean Coal, the different things that they're working on there. Uh, as Secretary Mueller explained to us, really their interest in China is twofold. One, they are able to do things on a different scale than we are able to do here in the U.S. Research projects in the U.S. typically start at one megawatt range. Then they see how that works for a little while, and then maybe they go to five megawatts, and then maybe eventually to 10. And at some point, they figure out that something can or cannot be commercially feasible. But that time frame is much longer than what it is in China. When they decide to build something in China to see if it works, they build something uh, big, and they, they get after it. Also in China, um, there is very little, if any, environmental review. No challenges in court about uh, environmental impact studies or things like that. Again, they are able to build things on a much quicker um, pace than we are. Many of you are familiar with NARUC. That is the National Association of Utility Commissioners. Uh, we're over 100 years old. Um, it really is a nice forum for us to talk to our commissioners from around the country and see what other challenges that they're facing. We have three meetings a year. Um, Deputy Chair Russell is here. He just got back from D.C. from the winter meetings, and then we meet in July and uh, November as well. Here are the commissioners that attended the China trip with me. Uh, Lisa Edgar from Florida was the neighbor president at the time. Um, Travis Kavula, who's in the middle, is from Montana, and he is now the NARUP president. So we were there with uh, the upper level of our association. Uh, Brian Kalk from North Dakota is in his second or third term in North Dakota, and Brooks McCabe from West Virginia was a, a pretty new commissioner. I think he'd been there about six weeks before he left for China. Just a, a wonderful group. We had a great time together. So here's the map of China. I don't know if I can do this very well. I can't really see that too well, but we, uh, we were in four different cities. Um, we stayed in four different cities. We flew into Beijing. We were there four nights, and then we flew into a country to Xi'an for three nights, and then we flew to Guangzhou for a night, and then we drove into Hong Kong for our last two nights and flew home from there. Um, when I arrived in China, I was met by this impeccably dressed, beautiful Chinese um, young girl and she had a sign that said, Cara Brighton, USA. <laughs> so that was my welcome to China. She did not, um, I did not leave her sight until I was placed in a car out front of that uh, airport, for which I am very grateful. It was a massive airport, a lot going on. I had to go through customs. That's a picture of customs there on the right. And this will be my first observation of differences in our countries. I didn't recognize this until I got home. But when you go through customs in China, it says nationals and then foreigners. When you arrive back in the US and you go through customs, it says residents and guests. So maybe a subtle distinction, but one nonetheless. So we started in Beijing. We were there four dates. Uh, Monday and Wednesday, we had various meetings all day. We had a pretty brutal schedule, I would say. Um, a lot of the difficulty in scheduling trips in China are just the transportation. It takes a long time to get anywhere. We spend as much time on the bus as I think we did doing anything. Monday morning, our first stop was at the U.S. Embassy, and we were able to spend a significant amount of time with embassy staff, which was very interesting. We learned some of the basics. Uh, the exchange rate is six to one. Um, they talked about the, the weak legal system that they have in China, the concerns they have about ever reducing space for um, political demonstrations. 
We talked about the, the five-year plan there on their 13th version of that was introduced this year. And that really is the blueprint for how China operates on every front, including energy. Uh, we also met with the National Energy Administration, which is the, the central government portion of that. We met with some NGOs, which was also a very interesting discussion as well on what their efforts are in China, mostly to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also on basic pollution issues. And I felt um, it was interesting that the NRDC has a fairly large presence in China, but they talked about how they kind of struggled at first to figure out how to operate there because they were missing their their number one strategy that they use in the United States to deal with these issues, and that's litigation. And you can't sue the government in China. So they had to rework how they function. Uh, when I got to the hotel, again, just a, another difference in our countries, this was a, a placard sitting by the TV, and you probably can't read that, but it says, please be advised that the following popular websites listed are prohibited in the People's Republic of China and are blocked by the internet service provider. And on the back of that is Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Blogger, Daily Motion, uh, Dropbox, Google. You cannot get any Gmail product at all in China. Um, both of my email accounts, both the state, my professional and my personal uh, email accounts are Gmail based, so I had no email. I could Skype with my family, but I could not FaceTime with my family because they prohibit that site. So just another reminder that we were in a, a communist country. Uh, this was Wednesday's workshop where we really just stayed in the same place all day and had um, different workshops from the China uh, presenters and from the United States. Uh, this is the day that we, this is the only day that we had simultaneous translation. So in the back of that picture on the right, you'll see the black um, kind of cube. That's where they did their translating all day. It was kind of a low hum through the entire day. Um, but I kind of felt like I was on C-SPAN or something because I got to wear the headphones and and do all of that. So that was an interesting day. This is also the day that I got to speak, um, do my presentation, which was on the great state of Wyoming and our coal production. Um, it was refreshing to go somewhere and be able to talk about coal in a proud way. Um, I'll tell you, nationally, when I travel, especially in utility circles, um, it's not usually the best received message. So that was nice for me. Can't talk about Beijing without talking about air quality. Uh, this picture I did not take, but it was a picture taken at noon. Um, it's really hard to describe when you're used to the United States air quality standards what it's like to live in China in these cities. So a quick divergence. Uh, that gives you an idea of where, uh, this is PM 2.5 concentrations. As you know, those are the, the smallest that you can get. PM 10 uh, ends up in your lungs, but PM 2.5 is small enough that it can get into your bloodstream and they consider that the invisible killer. Um, a recent study estimates that 1.6 million people in China die every year from PM 2.5 um, issues or pollution issues. That's 4,400 people a day. I mean, it's just a staggering number. Um, I have seen other numbers that are half of that, but this is a problem, I think, throughout China. It's very difficult to know what the quality of data is that you're getting and what anything really means in terms of numbers. But you'll see there that vehicle pollution is the, is the largest source. The red line on this sheet shows the PM2.5 concentrations in Los Angeles compared to the monthly values in Beijing in 2013. This is the chart that the EPA uses to determine uh, what the level of um, air quality is in, this, in any particular time. China has actually just developed a, an alert system for their population. It went on a line in the end of 2013. It has four tiers color-coded, similar to our security issues, yellow, orange, red, et cetera. Um, they were really forced into this warning system by the U.S. Embassy, who in 2008 started posting what the readings were of 2.5 concentrations in Beijing. Until that time, no data had ever been available to the population about the standard of their air quality. Um, people were very alarmed at what the numbers were, and I think the Chinese government was very upset that the U.S. had been doing this, but ultimately, five years later, was able to work with, uh, I think mostly predominantly, the, uh, the U.S. Embassy to develop this four-tier system. When there is an alert, uh, car use is limited. You're supposed to only drive every other day. Factories are supposed to shut down for different periods of time. The first red alert was issued in, um, on Monday, December 7, 2015, 
which happened to coincide with the climate talks in Paris. Um, it lasted until Thursday that year or that that week, and really, this, what happened to solve the air quality issue was not reduction of use, but that a cold front arrived and actually blew out what they needed to to get the concentrations uh, back down to a lower level. When the alert was issued that day, the level was 291. And you can see on this chart that that falls into the very healthy, almost hazardous um, area. I will say that the, um, the prohibitions on trying to limit things in terms of factories and, and car driving are very difficult to enforce in China. Um, there's a lot of corruption in trying to enforce those things and a, a great deal of concern about losing any sort of economic production at all. So this is a list of other Chinese cities and their uh, average pollution. You'll see that Beijing doesn't even make this list. In between our, our days in, in Beijing, we did make a road trip to Tianjin, China. This is where uh, the Green Gen project is, that is a carbon sequestration project. Um, as I said, we spent a lot of time on the bus. This day was, was probably the longest on the bus. Um, I was amazed. We drove probably more than an hour. And uh, from being from Wyoming, we never ran out of population. We never ran out of skyscrapers and cranes. I, I stopped counting cranes at 50. Uh, the, the amount of development and construction and just population base, again, from, for somebody from Wyoming, is just really overwhelming. It's just, um, it's an incredible thing to see. Uh, I will note on this, when we were coming back from Tianjin that day, they had shut off the, um, the freeway and everybody had to get off and go to a checkpoint. And uh, traffic was backed up for miles. Um, but everybody had to get out of their car, open all the doors, open the trunk, and be inspected. Again, just something you don't see in our country. This is the, uh, the Green Gen plant. This is a model of the plant. Uh, for those of you not familiar with it, it's a three-phase project, three project. Commenced construction in June of 2000. Uh, phase one was about 150 megawatts. Uh, by the time they get through phase three, it'll be 400 megawatts. And they plan to sequester 2 million tons of CO2 a year. Uh, they are now looking at um, different sites where they can take that CO2 by pipeline. Um, total investment has been very difficult to determine, but the, the estimate that I saw more than once was $3.8 billion. Uh, this project is owned by the China Huanan Group, which is, uh, has some private ownership, seven Chinese state-owned companies, and Peabody also has an interest in this plant. We, um, we were treated like celebrities, really, at this plant. The plant uh, operator uh, toured us through everything. He took us back to his private dining room for lunch. Um, <clears throat> I, I gave myself a, a big pep talk before I left for China that I was going to be really open about the food. I was going to try different things. Um, and I think I did a pretty good job, except for maybe this day. Um, he had a, a private chef, and we just didn't have, I, I just didn't have any idea what we were eating. And in China, they just bring everything out into a round thing in the middle, and you just serve it around as family style. And it was really hot that day, and it just didn't smell very good. <laughs> and so I had a hard time that day trying to have any lunch. But he, was, uh, he could not have been more gracious, and he was just a wonderful host. Um, I did want to note, while we were, uh, soon after we left Tianjin is when they had the explosions there. I don't know how many of you remember that last summer. Again, another huge difference in our countries. Um, they had no idea what was even being stored in that warehouse. Uh, firefighters, first responders had no idea how to respond when they got there because they didn't know it was being stored. So they sprayed water, which caused subsequent explosions. Uh, 173 deaths. Um, 5,600 families were living within a kilometer radius of this warehouse. Again, that would not happen in the United States. Uh, within three days, they had 6,000 people living in tents. So. It was, it was something to watch. It was just devastating to see the, the photographs on the, news, um, on the newspapers. And shortly thereafter, because the Chinese authorities were concerned about how this event would be portrayed, they banned, they censored words like Tianjin and explosion and shut down anybody's website who used those terms to talk about what had happened there. So this is a map of the different airports. This is another area of huge investment in China. I will tell you, um, I was really glad that we got to fly intra-country to get a sense of their airlines. Their airports that I was in were just immaculate. They're huge. They're modern. They're new. Um, they are expanding all of those. 
I will tell you that um, if you think TSA is tough in the United States, you should have a Chinese pat down before you get on a plane. It's thorough. Um, and I would say their flight attendants are probably six to one of ours. And we got lunch on the plane. We, you know, you get food, you get different things that we don't see much here anymore. It was a very pleasant experience. This is a picture of uh, an advertisement in the Beijing airport for an agricultural bank. We decided these were the happiest and best dressed farmers we had ever seen. But we're fairly confident that if you went to Western China and looked at some of the rural areas, this is not probably what you would see. So then we went to Xi'an. Um, we met there with the uh, regional office of the National Energy Administration. Uh, that was just been founded in December of 2013, a huge effort in China to decentralize some of the decisions made about energy. Uh, their main function is to supervise the power markets in the region. Also while we were in Xi'an, we visited the Thermal uh, Power Research Institute. This is a huge R&D facility in China. Um, they have about 2,000 scientists here. More than 80 of them are PhDs, <coughs> 520 master's degree. One of their major um, efforts is to look at coal. Uh, they're looking at a lot of coal, clean coal technologies and different things like that. Um, I also wanted to put this picture up to give you an idea. This was very typical of wherever we went for a meeting. There was some sort of a sign announcing our arrival. We were photographed as the bus pulled up. We were photographed as we got off the bus. We were photographed once we got in. Several photographs during meetings and then always one after the meeting. Saturday was our day off and so we went and did a couple of tourist things. We had a lovely uh, tour guide named Grace who was wonderful. We drove up to the Terracotta Warriors. <clears throat> it was supposed to take about an hour and a half from Beijing, or I'm sorry, from Xi'an. But um, as we were en route, uh, our bus driver realized that the government had shut down one of the freeways that we wanted to use. And so it was it, without any notice. <laughs> and so it was actually a three hour trip. There was quite a change in, in topography as we went up to this area. But you can see some different things um, that we saw just looking out the window of our bus. The traffic is really indescribable. Uh, that middle lane kind of changes from time to time in, in direction. If there isn't anyone coming for a, a short space, other people just decide to go in that the other way. <laughs> um, the fact that we didn't get into an accident I, is just been amazing to me. But uh, we did see some other just interesting things. Here's the Terracotta Warriors. Um, it's really difficult to describe how big this is and how amazing it is. Um, these went really uncovered for about 2,000 years. In 1974, a couple of Chinese farmers were digging a water well, and they found the top of one of the heads of one of the terracotta warriors. And this, this, this excavation has gone on from there. Um, they think it was about a 40-year project at the time it occurred. They think there are more than 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 670 horses. Every single one of them is different. Um, and they have yet to. Um, uncover the emperor's tomb. So there's still quite a bit of work to do here. This has become very much a tourist area, and they, they know how to do that pretty well, too. That did look a little American, actually. Um, but it was just, it was an incredible, incredible thing to see. And we went back into Xi'an. We did stop at the Muslim Quarter. I was unaware that there was a Muslim po uh, population in China. Uh, they have been, I think, fairly well protected, it sounds like to me. For example, the one-child policy has never applied to the Muslim population. They've been able to have as many children as they want. This is the mosque that we toured. And then this is really their market that we had. Um, all kinds of different foods, um, all sorts of different products, scarves, chopsticks, anything that you might want to bring back. And they tell you not to ever pay more than half of what they're asking for. So it gets kind of to be its own little sport of you know, negotiating what the price is going to be. And, and you'll give up on them, and you'll start walking out. They'll literally chase you down the, the road <laughs> to come back and buy something. Um, in the bottom, that's <coughs> uh, Commissioner Kavula <coughs> with our intra-country support. His name is Ronnie. He arranged for everything. He was just invaluable to us for the entire trip. From Xi'an, we, went, we did fly to Guangzhou. We met with the China Energy Regulatory Bureau of National Energy Administration. They've been there about 10 years. They were um, very interested in learning from American regulators. They talked a lot about market and competition. 
and things like that. So that was an interesting discussion. From there, we drove on to Shenzhen, which is uh, been a special economic zone and been very successful in China in trying to diversify their economy a little bit and give them a little bit more freedoms when it comes to uh, economics. They have about 10 million people in the city of Shenzhen, but 6 million of them are non-local migrant workers who are only in town during the week and return home uh, during the weekend. The only place that we really stopped in Shenzhen was the emissions exchange. Uh, this was the only meeting we had in China that was conducted completely in English. Uh, it was a very interesting meeting to talk about their cap and trade uh, system. At this point, there is no generation in the system, nor are there any transportation. This is really buildings at this point. They set up the allowances. They have a 10% uh, add-on just in case they might need it. So I'm not, the cap includes a 10% allowance. Uh, the, all the shareholders of the exchange are state-owned. They just completed their first year of operation. The price varied from $4.67 to $23.83. Um, they have requirements that these certain buildings comply, and uh, not surprisingly, their compliance rate was 99.8% in the first year. So from Shenzhen, we drove into Hong Kong. We went through a couple of different customs area where Everyone had to get out of the car. The car had to be searched. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if it's Hong Kong. I, I, I definitely plan to go back to Hong Kong, so I'll have to see if, this, if my first impression holds up. But we'd, we'd been on mainland China for about 10 days. And so driving into Hong Kong, there was all this water and these beautiful buildings. And the sky was bluer. And my phone started going crazy because I was actually finally able to get some emails. So I just kind of took a deep breath and felt like we were kind of back to freedom. Um, so, although I didn't feel constrained really in China, when I drove into Hong Kong, I did have a different sense of it. Uh, we met there uh, the next day with the U.S. consulate. We had a very interesting lunch with the independent power producers, an interesting group in Hong Kong. And then I had the opportunity to meet with a utility in the afternoon that was much more Western in terms of how they operate than the uh, other entities that we had been meeting with. I flew home from Hong Kong. And just like when I arrived in Beijing, I had a, a cute little girl waiting for me there um, to welcome me home. And I was sure glad to get home. So just a few things about some comparisons that you may not have thought about previously. These are how our countries compare, both in land mass and in latitude. So when we were in Beijing, you can see that the weather was be very much like perhaps Washington, DC. And we were there in August. And as we continued to go south, you can see you can see what you could expect in terms of conditions. By the time we got to Hong Kong, it's very much like Havana, I think, uh, very lush, tropical. Uh, the largest city in China is 32.4 uh, million people. Our largest city is New York, 8 million people. And then Los Angeles is probably half of that. This is a really interesting chart that has a lot of information on it that I won't go through today. But it's a comparison of China and the United States in various uh, categories. China is in red, the US is in blue. And some of these numbers are somewhat old, but you'll see um, in 2012 GDP growth, China 7.8%, US 2%. Carbon emissions 2009, China 2.1 billion tons, US 1.4. GDP per capita 2012, China $9,800, the United States $49,800. If your home was in China rather than the US, you would make 81% less money. You would spend 96% less on health care. You would use 68% less energy, electricity, sorry. And you would be 80% less likely to be murdered. Here's energy consumption comparison in China and the United States in 2014. Their energy consumption is relatively low. It's about a third of what it is in the US. However, they do burn more coal than the rest of the world combined. And um, much, much of their coal burning is, is quite inefficient. To produce one unit of GDP, China uses 3.3 times more energy than the United States. Here's a comparison of our carbon footprints. Again, China is in red, the US in blue. And you'll see the rest of the world there, along with some projections for, the, uh, 20, for 2030. <clears throat> a lot of the reason that their uh, per capita electricity consumption is increasing is due to this chart right here. 
the, the incredible urbanization of their population um, moving from the rural areas to, um, to the cities. They then all start getting cars. I mean, you know, it just becomes a much more urban lifestyle that has much more energy focus. This is a comparison to how decision making is done in China versus the US when it comes to electricity pricing, planning, et cetera. And you'll see that really the models are flip-flopped. When you look at China, well, let me start with the US because that's the model that I'm most familiar with. You'll see that big circle on the bottom. That's what state commissioners get to do. We, we approve projects. We set rates. We look at revenue requirement. Um, we oversee reliability and system operations. We are really the entity that makes sure all of that is going according to plan in the United States. Nationally, we get oversight on reliability standards and other things like that. But the bulk of what happens in terms of utility monitoring in the United States happens at the state level. Conversely, in China, uh, central planning is everything. They plan uh, large projects. And I'm going to talk at the end that there's been some, sometimes we talk past each other. So a large project, well, let me say, in, in China, a small project that gets approved at the local level is 600 megawatts. That's a small project in China. So that can be done at the provincial level. But anything larger than that needs to be done at the central level. Uh, their system is not based on cost of service. Uh, during the planned economy, electricity was owned, planned, financed, and developed by the central government. Uh, they did try to do some corporatization of that sector in, in the early 2000s and they created the State Power Corporation. But despite some of those changes, uh, the, the system re remains very heavily government owned. This is a chart showing the differences in wholesale generation pricing, dispatch, grid uh, operation, and retail pricing. Again, in China, there is no link between cost and the way that they run their electricity system. Wholesale generation prices are based on estimates of what it should cost to build a plant, not on actual costs. In the United States, we dispatch generation, most places still, on an economic model, lowest marginal cost. In China, there are two grid companies, and they have a must-take relationship with the generation facilities. Those generation facilities are assigned operating hours, and everybody has the same number of operating hours. So efficiencies don't matter at all and whatever power they produce has to be taken onto the grid. This policy was intended to encourage new capacity by guaranteeing a revenue stream, and it's done just that. Uh, China is putting a 600 megawatt plant online every three weeks on average. They have um, a lot of surplus capacity right now with very inefficient dispatch. Uh, the prices that they charge their customers, again, is not um, based on cost of service. It's based on social um, priorities of the government. There is no transparency and very little regulation. This chart of retail prices is a little bit old. It's 2009. And if you want to put a Wyoming number in here about 2009, you'd probably be in the 8, 8.5 cent area. Um, we're now at 12 cents on average in, in the state of Wyoming. But e electricity in China is already uh, fairly expensive. Um, and there is a way that, there's a difference in the way that classes pay. The United States residential customers tend to pay the higher prices in the, in the sector because that's how cost of service model works out. However, in China, the commercial sector probably pays the highest. But heavy industry, agriculture, and residential prices are heavily subsidized uh, by the government. The United States approach is to reflect costs. The Chinese approach is intended to support key industries and maintain social stability. So just in concluding, I have a couple of thoughts. Well, I have a lot of thoughts about my trip to China. I've had a hard time even trying to put a presentation together because I just have so much to say. I could talk about China for a long time. And I've learned so much more about China since I've been home. But we did have different meanings of common terms. When you talk about pollution in the United States, I would say the first thing that comes to our minds is probably greenhouse gas emissions. In China, as I showed you, there are serious concerns about basic levels of air quality. They have pollution issues, in my mind, that are much more important uh, that they have to deal with before they can get to greenhouse gas emissions. Energy efficiency, um, they talk about that in um, that everything needs to be bigger, bigger projects, not, not smaller projects. When we talk about energy efficiency in, in the United States, we talk about end use. 
energy efficiency. There is nothing like that in China. Um, even the new buildings that they are building, there's no central um, sort of air conditioning. They still have a lot of window units if that person can afford it. Um, a lot of windows open during the winter when they're heating because they're given a certain amount um, of where their temperature needs to be. Um, so it's a very different concept. Um, again, I, I mentioned that they talk about market and competition a lot to us while we were there. It's clear to me that they have no concept <laughs> of what markets are or what competition means. Um, safety, when they talk about safety, they're talking about reliability. When we talk about safety, we probably talk about something different. Um, their reliability standards are extremely high, higher than I probably would have thought they would be, but they live in vertical cities. And so they have a number in their minds of what the population is that lives above floor 10, which they believe in their minds is not accessible without an elevator. And if you don't have electricity running, you don't have elevators. And it would cause a lot of disrupt, uh, disruption fairly quickly if they don't have uh, the power on. So they have, they have very good reliability standards. Uh, the one that's not on the list that I'll just mention <clears throat> is small town. Um, the translator who was assigned to the DOE group, whenever we do our introductions at the beginning of a meeting, would say that she was from Nanning, China, in southern China, you know, just a small town in southern China, 6.6 .6 million people. Um, I told her that her definition of small town and mine were a, a little bit different. I was born in Wheatland, Wyoming, grew up in Kimball, Nebraska, um, 2,500 people tops. So she just couldn't even get that number in her head. So that was interesting. Uh, when it comes to the greenhouse gas emission reduction assurances that they made in Paris, uh, as I understand, what happened there is you're now divided into developing countries and, and developed countries. The developed countries will pay the developing countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. China is considered a developing country, um, and as such, none of their assurances are binding. And they will be receiving money from the developed countries to, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Much of the technologies that are being developed to do just that are being developed in China, will be manufactured in China to go to other countries such as India and, and China. Um, and it just seems to me we're asking China to do something that no industrial country have ever done in, in the history of our, of our world. And that is to continue to increase their standard of living, improve their standard of living. Uh, that will, in effect, uh, just naturally cause greater increases per capita of electricity. And um, they have a, a huge interest in growing their economy. So we're asking them to do all of that at the same time of reducing fossil fuel uh, development in their country. And it just seems to me that those those two things are not consistent, and so it will be interesting to watch how this goes forward. Um, in addition, the serious concerns that they do have with air quality emissions, much of the technologies, as you all know, to deal with, the, with those issues will add to greenhouse gas emissions because they will reduce the efficiency of those plants. So it will be interesting to see how China works through these issues um, on a climate basis and with their economic issues. When we were at the embassy, we were told that China has not had a recession in 40 years. And their lowest growth, annual growth to date, has been 10%. As you all know that are watching, it's, it's now falling probably to six, which has them in somewhat of a panic. So I don't know uh, going forward if we ask them to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and reduce fossil fuel, how their economy can continue to grow with those limitations. So it will be interesting to watch. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. Or if somebody who's been to China wants to say something different than I think, I'm, I'm happy to hear that as well. Sir? Yeah, and I don't know how much I can really talk about that. I, they just gave us the range of, of what, it, it, what the bids were at different points of the year, and those were the ranges that they gave us. I will tell you that um, they are looking at doing these, cap and these emission trading schemes in five other provinces around China. Shenzhen was the first one that has been up and running, and it's just been a year. Um, and I, one of the points that I wanted to make about it, though, is how limited 
it, what it encompasses right now is pretty limited. There's no power generation, there's no transportation sector. They're looking at buildings and trying to control greenhouse gas emissions from buildings at this point. So it's in its early stages, it will continue to grow. They were very excited about it and I think it will go to other provinces. I think they were disappointed in the lack of trading. They didn't have as much volume as they had anticipated. Um, people really are looking at a compliance standard instead of an investment which they were hoping they would draw some other investors in, and I don't think they've been successful in doing that yet, maybe because of the variety of the, the range of the prices. But I anticipate that will get more stable, and they will continue to bring in other sectors into the emissions trading scheme. Commissioner Brighton, uh, thanks very much for... Oh, oh sorry. Uh, I was like, I don't know where this coming from. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much for uh, this great presentation. And, you know, we have a lot that we're looking at uh, from the board level, uh, with the, especially with the ITC and some of the technology and alternative uses of coal. Were there two or three really promising things that when you heard there, you kind of had any aha moment <laughs> that if we could do this in Wyoming, it could help address the whole fossil sector or carbon you know, capture, reuse, uh, alternative coal uses at scale that uh, <coughs> it was very interesting. So we'd like to hear about any of that. Sure, uh, and these are just my observations. And I should have said this at the beginning, actually. These are, of course, all my thoughts, not thoughts of the Public Service Commission or the Mead Administration. Um, there was a lot of talk about sequestration, capture and sequestration. Um, but our visit to Green Gen, I think, it demonstrated the difficulty with capture and sequestration. They don't really even know where to go with that. I think right now they really are looking at enhanced, enhanced oil recovery. They're going to have to pipe that a long way to be able to make that work. Um, so they're struggling, I think, as we are in the United States on sequestration, capture and sequestration and, and use. Um, really what the Department of Energy, I, I realized, was focused on more while we were there, and I think some of the things that are going on at the Thermal Research Institute are trying to turn CO2 into a revenue stream. Can it help develop plastics? Can it be used as some other tool? Um, that's where I felt the most promise from a technology standpoint. I am um, not as convinced that, that capture and sequestration is going to be the answer that we all hope it would be. Um, I think it's going to be turning it into a value stream of some other, some other product, how it can be used in another product for manufacturing is really the, the brightest hope that I had for coal. Although it was very clear to me while we were there that China is nowhere close to being done with coal. Uh, that's all they have. They've been very unsuccessful in natural gas development. The shale revolution is not common to them at all. They are looking at uh, LNG imports um, to deal with their, to try to get some natural gas. They're also negotiating with Russia on a natural gas pipeline. And our understanding of those negotiations is that they're quite volatile, <laughs> kind of hot and heavy at some points, and then they don't talk for six months. So I don't know how firm of a resource that can possibly be for them. Uh, they will be on coal for a very long time, and they are applying a lot of research to that, but um, we didn't get into you know, <coughs> real good specifics about exactly where they think that might go. If, so just as a follow-up, if we wanted to learn more about some of the process uh, approaches that they're taking to, to use CO2 as a feedstock mm -hmm. in plastics, do you have contacts? I do, and, and I would really encourage, I think that Thermal Research Institute is probably the, at the forefront of that. Um, and, and I'm sure you've met David Moeller when he was here. I think he was here for your spring conference last year. If you haven't, I'm happy to get you in touch with him. Um, he worked at Duke Energy most of his career and has just recently gone into the federal government um, and so has a, a large uh, understanding of coal and his experience in coal, and he would probably be the person that could get you up to speed the quickest. In addition, uh, their laboratory in West Virginia, I think, is, is the U.S. equivalent of that, where most of this research is going on. Their website has a lot of information about the different areas that they're pursuing. Commissioner Brighton, what level of uh, emission controls uh, on the coal power plants uh, did you think were there? And the second question is, uh, did you experience any evidence of emission control systems on coal power plants being turned off in lieu of providing more power to the public? Um, I didn't have, I didn't see any emissions control. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about that. My sense was that um, instead of trying to retrofit uh, existing plants, that their heavy construction schedule and building a um, 
a more efficient plant at the 600 megawatt size was really designed to incorporate some of the efficiencies and emissions control technology into the new construction rather than retrofitting. That's not to say that that's not happening, but we didn't hear much about that at all. So my name is Holly Krakett, and I'm with Tri-State, but I've been employed by Shenwa Group for the last three years. So actually, um, let me, there's two things. Do you mind going back to your slide on the PM 2.5 missions? Um, and I, while we're getting there, I'll answer your question on the emissions control. So all large power plants, which large is like 600 megawatts or greater, actually have stricter emissions control limits than we have in the United States. So it's about, uh, I think it's about 50 ppm for particulate matter and 20 and 20 for um, SO2 and NOx. And I'm getting a little confused because Shenhua Group uh, runs their plants at the limits for natural gas plants. So I'd have to look up the exact numbers for the, uh, the whole country, but their limits are lower than ours. But having said that, the only control room I ever went in, I mean, they have the numbers right on the screen and they weren't meeting uh, the limits. And I didn't, I asked why that was, and they said, well, they're still adding the retrofits. But in essence, what they're doing is, you're right, they're small, small plants, they're decommissioning. But the large plants that are existing are being retrofitted. And supposedly with stronger emissions control than we have. And, I saw the equipment getting, getting built, so it really is being put in place. And so it brings you to this graph, um, which I think is really important. Um, did they break down that coal pollution at all? No. Oh, just gave you these numbers. I, I actually found this number. This wasn't associated okay, with okay. it. So we didn't talk about that when I was there. I think that the first question that was asked, actually the answers lie in this. So direct and indirect vehicle emissions. So which you pointed out throughout your presentation, China doesn't always enforce uh, emissions control standards. And one of the things that hasn't been enforced historically is sulfur standards on vehicle fuel. So that means that their cars are basically operating without catalytic converters, which we already, we, we did that in the US and we know how it goes. So I actually look at this graph and I see an opportunity for coal because we're talking about you know, hundreds of millions of cars that are already operating without catalytic converters. So I have this dream and I think it's not my dream, it's Shenhua's dream and anyone who is trying to clean up city pollution in China, that there's an opportunity for coal and the University of Wyoming is working on like gasification technologies where that coal pollution, a lot of it is not from coal-fired power plants. It's from these small industrial facilities that are really hard to clean up. But if you could provide them with affordable syngas, those that are just using the coal for heat could burn that and have very low emissions. Um, and then the other thing would be uh, opportunities for coal. Um, China's already the biggest and the best on coal to liquids, and there's a lot of good research in Wyoming. So I was looking at these pens the other day and thinking about the idea of exporting coal to China, but there's also huge opportunities to export and import technologies that are being researched here. There's questions on how do you do that and protect your technology developers. I'll leave that to people who are better at that kind of thing than I am, but there really are real opportunities to make a difference in air pollution while they still rely on their coal fleet. So I think I was just looking at this slide and I think it's misleading. And in Beijing, for example, they have four coal fire power plants they are going to shut down and that is not going to impact the air quality in that city. But it's just a political, even in China, they're receptive to public opinion. So if we somehow could use coal to displace some of the higher sulfur fuels or displace some of the, you probably saw it when you were driving around the industrial facilities that just have you know, a mess coming out their chimneys. Mm -hmm. It's no emissions control whatsoever. If that could get displaced, you could really make a difference and save some of those people's lives. Absolutely. So I thought your presentation was really interesting. Thank you. But again, we didn't really talk about that when we were in China. Um, what I've read since I've been home, um, they are making some efforts, I think, in the nuclear area, and I think they will do a small portion of that. Um, when it comes to renewable, but that remains, I think, fairly unpopular from a public perspective. I think that safety issue is just really hard to get around for nuclear, even in China. Uh, the renewable issues, I think they have some very, they have some limited areas of their country where that 
is workable and where it's feasible. Um, and they may build a wind farm, but they have a really hard time even getting it connected to the grid. And even if they do get connected from the grid to having their power taken by the grid. Um, it's just treated very differently. It's a very small part of what they're doing now. They certainly are talking about expanding it. Um, but a lot of things that I have read is that it's just not feasible in the short term that renewables will be a very large piece of their um, energy puzzle. Yeah, I think those are really good points. I, th I think there's no question that they know on the international stage that there are certain things that they need to show some willingness to do. But I believe at the end of the day that nothing will come in, in way of their economic development because it's hard to understand this as, as Americans probably, but their number one goal of their national government is to maintain order. And that is a very slippery thing with a population of their size. And so um, it, it's interesting to watch this dance. And I think, I think some of your insights are probably are, are right on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.